to Middle East Focus. Today, April 21st, U.S. President Barack Obama is in Saudi Arabia for a summit with Gulf Arab leaders, offering them a chance to repair relations strained by last year's nuclear deal with Iran. This follows Secretary of State John Kerry's recent visits to Iraq and Afghanistan. We will go back to U.S. foreign diplomacy and policy in the Middle East in a few minutes, but first, let's start with this week's headlines from the region. Today, my message uh, to Iran and to the Iranian people would like to be that diplomacy is worthy. Siamo venuti per richiamare l'attenzione del mondo su questa grave crisi umanitaria e per implorarne la risoluzione. Joining us now in the studio is Dr. Offer Israeli, an international security policy and Middle East expert from the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya and the University of Haifa. Thank you for coming. Um, so why is President Barack Obama visiting Saudi Arabia now, just before he's due to leave his office? We can talk about two points. Maybe the, the first point is uh, the formal point. He is traveling to Saudi Arabia to take part in this summit, the GCC-US summit, maybe to think together with the, uh, with the Saudis and the other uh, regimes in the Gulf, mm -hmm. uh, how to make again the security issue between the, the side, maybe involving of NATO and other uh, topics. The second uh, point, in uh, I think, that is trying uh, in the last year in office even less than a year in, in office, sure. is trying to maybe to talk to the history, think about his legacy. He don't want to be the president who broke uh, the relations of maybe six or seven decades long between uh, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. And offer now that you've mentioned this, I want to make a small, a short stop here uh, for a moment of history. Bilateral relations between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United States began in 1933, when full diplomatic ties were established. Despite the differences between the two countries, the two have been allies. I-24 News Law and ISO highlights moments throughout their shared history. Our relations with Saudi Arabia have been long, close, and cordial. In the days ahead, the friendship between the Saudi Arabian and American people will be a strong and vital force in the world. A special relationship, the phrase that is used to describe the unique friendship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, divided by political differences but connected by military and economic interest. Since the alliance between the two nations began following World War II, U.S. leaders have found it in their best interest to maintain mutual cooperation. 1990, the beginning of the Gulf War. After Iraq invaded Kuwait, President George H.W. Bush ordered a U.S. Air Force base to be established in Saudi Arabia in order to protect its ally from a potential Iraqi invasion and serve the U.S. Air Force in the coming conflict. We're here to protect freedom, we're here to protect our future, and we are here to protect innocent life. Military relations between the nations have always been strong. In 1981, Ronald Reagan's administration made what was then the largest and arguably most controversial foreign arms sale in U.S. history. That deal was only outdone by another sale made to the kingdom in 2010, a $60.5 billion arms deal. From Roosevelt to Obama, throughout the last 70 years, the alliance was held, but not without turbulence. September 11, 2001 was a turning point in U.S.-Saudi relations. Saudi Arabia was accused of funding the worst terror attack in U.S. history, something it vehemently denied. The 2003 invasion of Iraq and the U.S. war on terror was also something the Saudis were uneasy with. The president, however, George W. Bush, maintained a friendship with the Saudi king at the time, which some had trouble with, and led to accusations that the president himself was involved in a conspiracy behind the attack. Relations were further complicated when the Obama administration signed a nuclear agreement with Iran last year. While the U.S. relieves sanctions and restrictions, the Saudis believe this is boosting the kingdom's greatest threat. Iran 
will not have a nuclear weapon. The U.S. has done everything it can to appease their concerns, but unsuccessfully. While the Iran rift has put a snag on relations, it has been in President Barack Obama's best interest to keep the friendship with Riyadh. U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter says this is for two reasons. The two new uh, challenges uh, that preoccupy both the United States and Saudi Arabia today are, first of all, Iran uh, and its malign activities in the region and potential for aggression, uh, number one, and number two, ISIL and other uh, forms of violent extremism uh, in the region. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, in a meeting with Gulf allies last week, reassured the Saudis that they share a common goal. There is no difference about our mutually agreed upon objective. But Saudi Arabia's foreign minister agreed to disagree. Some of these differences are an objective, very few. But most of the differences are in tactics. With President Obama expected to arrive in Riyadh this week to meet with King Salman, the question remains, how fundamental are the differences between the United States and Saudi Arabia, and will continued relations be mutually beneficial? Joining us now from London is retired Colonel Richard Kemp, former commander of British forces in Afghanistan. Thank you for being with us. Um, Colonel Kemp, in the course of recent years, many viewed President Obama's policy in the Middle East as turning the back on Saudi Arabia and its longtime allies. Others, however, saw a strong leader leading a historic deal with Iran and refusing to drag the United States into fighting regional wars on the behalf of its allies. Where do you stand? Well, of course, the latter position that President Obama takes, and that's what he himself is doing. My, my view is the opposite. As, in fact, he abandoned his allies in the region. He's abandoned Saudi Arabia. He's abandoned Israel. He's abandoned other long-term allies there um, in supporting uh, Iran. And Iran, um, because of the deal that he's made, the nuclear deal that he, he's led, Iran has been emboldened in the region. It's been emboldened to, for example, to uh, be more aggressive in Syria in support of President Assad and in Yemen, um, where it's been fomenting and, uh, and supporting a a civil war which threatens Saudi Arabia and threatens us all. So I think that, that that's the real position, that, that uh, he's emboldened uh, Iran and therefore terrified uh, his other allies in the region. And of course, he, he, the deal has also paved the way eventually for Iran to gain a nuclear weapon itself. And, and so he, he's also uh, helped to encourage a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, which Saudi's part of. Do you view Obama's visit to Saudi Arabia and John Kerry's recent visits to Iraq and Afghanistan under the same context? Is there a similar goal behind their visits? I, I think without a doubt. And, and, and that goal is to try and salvage some of his um, broken reputation in the Middle East among, um, among the, uh, the allies such as Saudi Arabia. And of course, he, you know, the, as Offa said, he's got a... He's got a uh, a, 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 his, his legacy to think about. He doesn't want to be seen as having all of his policies failed. And so he's trying to salvage the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi. And I think, I think it's important that he does that. I think he needs to salvage that relationship because Saudi or, you know, whatever anyone thinks of Saudi Arabia, uh, its human rights policy, its, act, its policies towards uh, extremists, uh, he is, the Saudi Arabia is a very, very important ally for, for the West. Richard Cam, thank you so much for this. And Offer, do you also view Obama's uh, visit in Saudi Arabia as a sort of a compensation for the Saudis in light of the nuclear deal? Sure. The nuclear run deal is on the table all the time. You know, uh, the Saudis are really afraid from the uh, Iran influence in the region. This uh, uh, clashes between the Shia and Sunnah for decades and uh, hundreds of years and uh, now become to be a real issue in the, in the Gulf. They are afraid from Iran. They want the protection, maybe, of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, selling arms to, the, uh, to, to this area to protect themselves by themselves against the Iranians, but also to know that there is someone in the White House really care about the, uh, these uh, monarchies, uh, uh, taking care to keep their uh, regimes, uh, and uh, so on. So what Arab Gulf leaders, for example, what are they expecting President Obama to tell them now? I think that they are expecting to maybe to go back in time 
to feel, yeah, to feel that, uh, as we said, that someone in the White House really care about uh, their security. Uh, the colonel said that uh, about uh, sending troops there to, to this area. I think that America uh, pulling pulling out, pulling out from the from the area, but to know that there is someone who take care about the regimes and protecting them from Iran. Dr. Offer Israeli, thank you so much for this. Thank you for having me here. A few weeks ago, Saudi Arabia's Council of Ministers issued a new regulation narrowing the powers of the country's religious police. Now, let's say hello to Dov Libel, Arab Affairs reporter at Times of Israel. Thank you for being here. So, what is actually the religious police and how will their authorities be reduced now? Okay, well, it's an institution that goes back to the 1940s. They're officially called the... the mm, Committee for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, and they are tasked by the Saudi government for enforcing the strict interpretation of Islam within the kingdom. That means enforcing the segregation of the sexes or enforcing how people dress to make sure that it's uh, correct with their interpretation of Islam, to make sure that people aren't playing music in the streets, something that's forbidden, or that there's no alcohol being uh, drunk in anywhere. So basically they are patrolling the, the streets and just noticing a case and uh, they are connection? They are patrolling the streets, and a little bit we'll see an example of that. Uh, they patrol the streets. Their activities uh, tend to uh, attack women more than men. They are seen as badgering women, uh, kind of uh, a killjoy. Uh, you know, women might wear uh, some nail polish or dress a little differently and they could be targeted by the religious police for that. So let's watch one example that you've mentioned before. You brought us a video from a shopping mall, right? That's right. Uh, this video of uh, a woman whose only crime was to wear nail polish. She was targeted uh, by the religious police for this and the people should, who watch the video should take notice of two things. One, that she is taking the video of herself and she threatens to put it on social media. And two, that the religious police need the help of the regular police in order to enforce uh, in order to enforce their law. Let's have a look. Dov, so do you view this decision to reduce their authorities now as a step towards modernization? Uh, I don't know if the Saudis would use the term modernization themselves. Mm -hmm. They see it as a step towards reform in their own kingdom that they feel needs to be done to give women more rights within their own ethical and moral framework. It's a social issue, not a religious issue. Um, what's pushing it forward is that in Saudi Arabia, unlike places like China and Iran, social media is not blocked by the government, and it's a, a kind of a sanctum for the youth of Saudi Arabia, which is 30, 50, sorry, 50 percent is under the age of 30. And they use social media as a way to express themselves in private when they can't do it in public, and also as a way to voice their concerns about what's happening around them. And the Saudi king heard their voicing of their concern, and in the statement in which the Saudi kingdom uh, limited the, the powers of, this, of the religious police, they admonished the religious police, saying that you should be kind and gentle like the Prophet Muhammad. This was really tongue-in-cheek from the king. And kind and gentle. Yes. Interesting. And uh, Saudi foreign minister, he gave a speech recently, especially when it comes to women. He was asked, take it from there. Uh, he was asked about uh, the issue of women driving in Saudi Arabia, and is there really progression the for women? Issue. The Everybody top issue. Everybody sp speaks yes. about it. Yeah, of course. So let's have a listen to what he said regarding this point. I'm not saying give us 200 years. I'm just saying be patient. And when it comes to societal change, in every society, people tend to look at where they are, where they are now, and they think everybody should be with us. Again, I will quote America, maybe because I spent so much of my life there. America was independent in 1776. The Republic was founded, what, two decades later? It took almost 80 years before slavery was abolished. It took a hundred years 
before there was a civil rights movement. Now, you hope that in the modern world with technology and with communications, this process is accelerated, but it takes time. And of this is not the only example. Uh, yes. Uh, in this same speech, uh, Adel Joubert, the, the foreign affairs minister for Saudi Arabia, he talks about how in the 1960s, no Saudi women were in universities. Today, 55% of undergraduates are women. And he says another stat that he says embarrasses him as a Saudi man that over 60% of, of people in postgraduate school in Saudi Arabia are Saudi women. Mm -hmm. Don't believe her. On that note, we will finish. Thank you so much for coming for here. That is all for Middle East Focus for today. Next week, we'll be back with more stories from the region. Thank you for being with us and see you again very soon.